On this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, more takeaways from the Texans versus Jag game and the Houston Texans add depth to their defensive front. Cody and I also look at knees, knee issue for Larry Tunsil. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, 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 Texans fans to this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. To our first-time listeners and subscribers out there, thank you for stopping by. If this is your first time checking us out, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment to the Locked On Texans podcast on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you to all of our returning listeners Lending your ears, we continue to talk Texans here on this Tuesday. I am your host, John, some sports guy Hickman, and of course, joining me as always, the man with the plan behind the scenes. Whatever you want to know, he got it, he can bring it to you hmm. in the locker room or in the post press conferences. Texans credential media member, Sports Illustrated's own Cody Davis. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use promo code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. D'Amico Ryan sending calls to the league. What's <laughs> that about? The Houston Texans add Derek Barnett to their defensive line. That should help generate what sacks. Well, we start off today's show looking at more from the Texans game, and then we're going to use that. To kind of segue over into something that Cody and I have been hinting at for the past maybe two weeks now, maybe going back a little bit further than that, but Larry Tunsil. And one of my takeaways from this Jags game this past Sunday, CJ Stroud was pressured on nearly 61% of his dropbacks. Oh, golly. Yeah. It's very hard to win a game, and which he nearly almost did. So that speaks to the uh, (laughs) – The greatness of C.J. Stroud did a very good job of understanding when to take off with the ball in his hands and use his legs. Would have liked him to see him do a little little bit of that more, especially in that final drive where the defense was giving him opportunity and room to run. But, you know, going back to Sunday's matchup, the offensive line had issues from the first drive. I know that uh, Titus Howard is out, and he's probably – that injury did not look good. He went to the blue tent was unable to really put weight on that leg. They had to bring a card out for him to go back to the locker room. I would suspect that – I don't know if, if Titus Harbour comes back this season. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that I know anything, but it was it's week 12, and it was difficult for him to put pressure on that leg. And this is a guy that already had the battle injury already this year. So I don't, I don't suspect that he'd be back. That puts the offensive line for Houston is going to be going up against a very good – Defensive front over uh, with the with the uh, Broncos in, in a very compromising position. They've been getting after the quarterback lately and using that pressure to generate turnovers. But I think again, what I'm going to segue over to sixty one percent of the dropbacks with pressure for for CJ Stroud. That's unacceptable. You had Juice Scruggs who was thrown into the fire. I don't think that they had a plan for him to play his first week back at practice. But due to the injury of Titus Howard, he had to step in and left tackle or left guard, excuse me. And Data had a rough day. Data had a really rough day. Uh, Larry Tulsa had a rough day. Allow, I think, a sack and a half, maybe two of those sacks from Josh Allen. And dating back to maybe the Arizona Cardinal game. But his last couple of games, he's allowed a, com- a combined of 11 pressures. On the quarterback. Dating back to the Tampa Bay game, he's allowed five, no, I'm sorry, four sacks. This isn't the Laramie Tunsil that we've come to know and understand as a pro bowler who should have been an all pro one of those years here in Houston. Hmm. And I think it goes back to, I don't think he's fully recovered from that knee. He's a large man, right? He's a very athletic man. He's one of the better pass rushers in the league when healthy. So it's noticeable when something is off. And for the past few games, maybe all seasonal a little bit, he hasn't looked as dominant 
as we saw from Jeremy Tunsil in the past. You know, you were 100% correct on that. Larry Tunsil is still dealing with um, a knee injury, you know. And put it like this, ladies and gentlemen, it's not much that I can actually share, but I would say this. Do not be surprised if at the end of the Texan season, you get the notification saying that Laramie Tunsil is going to have some type of procedure done on his knee. It's nothing to be too alarmed with, only because I was told it's nothing like an ACL injury or or meniscus tear that he's trying to play through or anything like that. I was just told at this stage of his career, what he is going through is just the wear and tear of his body being a vet, you know, being one of the top players at his position, always giving it, giving it his all. And we have seen Laramie Tunsil. This is his fifth year with the Houston Texans. And to, to, to get a true understanding of, I don't want to use the term decline, um, because I, I think when whenever Larry Tunsil gets an opportunity to fully recover from his knee issue that he's dealing with, um, he's definitely going to be back to the Larry Tunsil that we all have loved through the first four years of his career here in the city of Houston. However, um, Josh Allen, you know, <laughs> he went to work against Larry Tunsil. Let's call it what it is. You know, Josh, Josh Allen finished Sunday's game with a career high 12 pressures, three sacks, and out of those 12 pressures, eight came against. Laramie Tunsil and Laramie Tunsil for this whole entire season, John, I know you talked about dating back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but ever since the start of the season, his pass blocking grade is graded at 79.6. That might sound pretty good to your, let's say, above average offensive tackle. However, through the first four years of his career here in the city of Houston, 86 was his pass blocking grade. As of right now, so far this season, Laramie Tunsil has given up five sacks. In the first four years alone, he gave up a combined six sacks. So I only brought that to your attention because it showcased that whenever he gets a real opportunity to fully recover, as I just mentioned, do not be surprised. At the end of the season, you get that notification saying Laramie Tunsil is going to have some type of procedure on his knee. But I think whenever he gets an opportunity to get 100% healthy again, we're definitely going to see the Laramie Tunsil that we all loved over the first four years of his career here in the city of Houston. Because even though he has given up five sacks, to know that you have a pass blocking grade of 79.6, and this is your quote-unquote down year, lets me know that the talent is still there. You're a veteran. The experience is still there. Everything with Laramie Tunsil is still there. So, You know, and and that's also part of the reason why they give Laramie Tunsil every Wednesday off every time that injury report comes out. Clean him up a little bit. Exactly. And that's part of the reason why he's been limited a lot here in practice because the 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 thinking is give him a less workload throughout practice. You definitely going to that's definitely going to put him in a situation where he will be more productive throughout the game. Now to flip things over to Titus Howard, John, you were sitting right next to me when he was carted off the field at the blue tent and there's some good news I can share, but I'm actually kind of, kind of, kind of nervous because after the game, I had an opportunity to see Titus Howard walking around a locker room on his own. And it seemed like it was the left knee that he had some type of issue with because that whole entire leg was wrapped up in like a sleeve. So the good news is he was walking on his own. The bad news is that's the same thing I saw from Eric Murray. Remember a couple of weeks ago when he left the game with a knee injury, he was walking around the locker room with his leg wrapped up and come to find out, I believe he ended up with a torn meniscus or a torn ACL. I can't remember which one it was, but it ended up being a devastating knee injury. We talked to Coach D'Amico Ryan so on Monday. He did not have an update on Titus Howard as of right now. So, of course, either later on today or without a shadow of a doubt, come Wednesday morning, we would definitely have more information on Titus Howell. But the fact that he was walking on that knee, walking on that leg was good news. Yeah. Um, before we move on and talk about how the Houston Texans added Derek Barnett, I was almost, almost said Derek Rivers. I do want to mention that I also I am wondering the, uh, the future status of Dalton Schultz. And so this is Monday evening. We're recording right now. Tuesday, 
whenever the injury report comes out, I'm kind of wondering what's going on with that situation. Dalton Schultz played, well, excuse me, Dalton Schultz in the first half, 14 routes ran. In the fourth quarter, only three. Now, Brevin Jordan in the first half, one route ran. In the fourth quarter, 14. And if you guys go back to the play where CJ took a shot to Dalton Schultz down the field, a lot of us, even I'm sure you guys at home watching it, a lot of us in the press box, me and Miss Kim Davis, and we said and we, we thought to ourselves, did he even run that route at full speed? Yeah, I remember that. And he did not look like he had a good step. And so after that, I can't think of another snap that he played for Houston. I can't think of another route that he ran for Houston, and he only ran three routes. And two of those came the third and one and fourth and one. So I'm curious to see what's going on if there's an underlying injury that we may find out about Dalton Schultz. That's something I think we need to keep our eye on. Why the Houston Texans signing Derek Barnett is huge, and how does that tie in into some of the disappointment from Will Anderson this past Sunday? We'll talk about that coming up next. But first, hey, guys, this is my opportunity to let you in on the best kept. I don't know if it's a secret anymore, but one of my best kept secrets, and I tell everybody I can about it. My homeboys hit me up. Hey, man, I'm trying to do something nice for my wife tonight. Hey, man, I'm trying to hit a game. I know I'm late. But I know you're kind of plugged in. Where should I go? Who should I look at? Where, where, What app should I download? Hey, man, me and my mom, we may want to go hit up a comedy show tonight. I need tickets, last-minute tickets. I only point them to the best in the game, and that's game time. I'm not worrying about buying tickets. Neither should you. Neither should your friend. Neither should your uncle to the next big event. Game time has uh, tickets on sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. It's the easiest and fastest way to buy tickets. They got killer last-minute deals, all-in prices. And, again, I tell you guys this all of the time. My, fa- my favorite feature, views from your seat. And their best price guarantee game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets with their best price guarantee. You know what else is dope about game time? With zone deals, you pick the section and game time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. And game time guarantee means you always get the best price. If you find the same section and row for less, game time will credit you. 110% of the difference. It's a no-brainer here, guys. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets, download the Game Time app, create an account, use code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L. That's Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code, Locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back in, Locked on Texans listeners and viewers. Don't I look good? Y'all see this hat? Oh my God. Y'all so, y'all, so, y'all, so, my only question is y'all see so, y'all hat? think y'all gonna win the national championship with Archie Manny? No, nah, yeah, Archie Manny. Now, Archie Manny 2.0? He's, he's, he's not our starting quarterback. Right next now, year, right? Next year, yeah, I believe That's so. That's what I say, next year. Oh, yeah. But Archie Manny 2.0, Peyton Manny 2.0? Uh, I'm not going to say Eli Manny 2.0. First, you know, his Eli, name is Arch. Eli Eli was like Latoya, you know. So, you know, it's just the name. Oh, man. <laughs> Got my UT on, my jersey repping my UT Longhorns. Got the Inland Grove hat right here for my boy. Um, follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. I can tell you where to get one of these hats. Now, hmm. the Texans added Derek Barnett Monday. I think that was a good sign, and we'll get to his stats and numbers. But Anton Harrison allows zero pressures from the Texans. Trevor Lawrence was not touched <laughs> Sunday. I think he may have gotten maybe one QB hit on the blitz with Cashman or Will Anderson, and I think maybe two pressures throughout the game. Regardless, the Jags' offensive line did a good job of kind of containing and keeping their D-line and the pressure from the Texans in check. The Houston Texans 
And a, and a lot of people are, 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 you know, looking at the totality of the season and saying, well, Anderson's sack numbers aren't matching up for the trade up. I think he impacts the game in more ways than the sack numbers. And, and I, he impacted the mm-hmm. game in more ways than getting sack numbers this past Sunday. But I, I do think there's some room for critiquing. Will Anderson had a 3.4 win rate, pass rush win rate, which is the lowest of his career so far. Throughout the year, he's been around 21.4, which I believe that is the best for a rookie this year. Will Anderson did not have a good game in terms of helping the Texans defense get off the field by getting after the quarterback. And this is also after Cam Robinson went down. Which was the, the biggest the, disappointment to me, I must say. Right. And his, his the counterpart for Will Anderson, John Renard, who has been good for Houston, did not, uh, you know, get after the quarterback as well. He also struggled to touch Trevor Lawrence. So I say that to say this. While we're going to look at adding Derek Barnett, there has to be a conversation within the locker room. So the understanding of, guys, we have to get after quarterbacks. You got to get after Russ Wilson. You're going to have to get after um, any of these quarterbacks because your, your DBs, they're going to do their job. But how many times are we sitting there thinking to ourselves, well, ideally you would like to get some pressure up front so, you're, for, so your corners – and your safeties can get an opportunity of the, because of their pressure to create turnovers. They did once, and there's a Derek Stingley interception, hmm. but that was disappointing from the two bookends for the Houston Texans. And I also go as far as to say this. Jerry Hughes has not been playable for a good amount of this season. We saw the Houston Texans added Derek Rivers, claimed him off waivers after being released from the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm to be honest with you, I'm not really surprised by the lack of production we have seen out of Jerry Hughes. This was a guy at the end of last season. He was already thinking about retirement. And what did I say <laughs> at I think it was the start of OTAs, I believe? Jerry Hughes is literally just to just remained on this roster to be a voice within the locker room. And it makes sense because his locker is literally right next to Will Anderson Jr. And Will Anderson on several occasions has talked about time and time again, how much he has picked the brain in the mind and got so much advice from Jerry Hughes, just sitting in that locker room, just going over film. So, you know, I'm not too much looking at too, looking at the lack of production from Jerry Hughes. However, John, to your point, when you talk about the Texans' inability to get after the quarterback, especially what took place on Sunday, and I think that might have been even more disappointing than the play of the offensive line, even more disappointing than the subpar play calls that we saw out of Bobby Sloy. It was the fact that this offensive front, which over the last two, three weeks, ever since they, they got back from the bye, it seemed like they that they were trending upwards in terms of getting after the quarterback and completing sacks. Because remember, the game, I believe it was against the New Orleans Saints right before the bye week, correct? That was a game where they got after Derek Carr. I want to say, I think they recorded like 12 pressures in that game, if I'm not mistaken. And they didn't get a sack. And I remember I asked Coach D'Amico Ryans, what is something that you want to see this team improve on? And he said, finishing sacks. And what did they do over the next three to four games, starting with, unfortunately, the loss against the Carolina Panthers? They started getting after the quarterback even more, and they started finishing sacks. And we saw them do it again and do it again. And, and then Sunday, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, especially after Cam Robinson went out, where is the sense of urgency to, to 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 make these plays and look well, b- before I, I, before you take over, I do want to mention this. As of right now, the Houston Texans have recorded 119 pressures, which is top half of the league, but they only have 39 sacks on the season, which is towards the bottom of the league. 
Yeah, but you know what? In all of those games, the deciding factor for those sacks, which we didn't see, is what? You know, did we we heard Will Anderson's name called Sunday? Mm-hmm. Did we hear Sheldon Rankin's name called Sunday? That is true. And I want to say, did we he hear had Malik Collins? Himself. Name called Sunday. Mm-mm. You know, I know Khalil Davis got in on the action on the tackle for loss on the run play, but between the two defensive tackles that I just mentioned, it's twenty million dollars for this season. Mm-hmm. And what we're able to see, I mean, the proof is there. They're going to be able to get sacks and generate those sacks when the D tackles are playing effective, when they mm-hmm. are impacting the game. Let me say that when they are impacting the game, then you're seeing John Gennard be able to kind of play discipline on that edge when that quarterback breaks out. John Gennard is getting the sack. Will Anderson is getting the sack, right? The D tackles for Houston all year has been a problem. Not a problem because they, they're just flat out worthless. That's not what I'm saying, but they have not been consistent. During that three to four game stretch, five game stretch, actually, the Saints, the Panthers, uh, uh, Joe Burrow, the uh, the uh, the Cardinals, right? Uh, what other team am I missing? I can't remember the Bucks, right? During that mm-hmm. you know five game stretch after the Saints, you saw the D tackles have good performances. Malik Collins with two sacks one week, Sheldon Rankins with three sacks one week. You know, a combination of uh, uh, both of those guys getting it done. You're seeing Khalil Davis getting on the action. He has a sack when they're playing great. Then you're seeing the DNs and the edge rushers have good games. When we look at the Houston, Texas adding Derek Barnett, this is a move that I'm kind of like, okay, what's the real impact here? The last two seasons for Derek Barnett, he's been featured in a total of just over 110 total snaps. No sacks from Derek River, Derek Barnett, excuse me, for the past two years. Uh, only three tackles, no pressures. No, no QB hits. He hasn't been an effective player in three seasons, four seasons, going back to 2020 with the Eagles, where 2019 and 2020, between those two years, had 13 sacks, over 20, 20 QB hits, um, over 40 hurries. That's when he was at his best. But in the last three seasons, I'm kind of looking at De- Derek Barnett, and I'm thinking to myself, Okay, what can you bring for Houston? You don't have – you didn't play any snaps on the inside. You were edge defender for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I think the production for the Eagles this year – because I think they tried to bring him back for a reason, right? I think I heard last year, if I remember correctly. But he was not able to be effective or impactful for the Eagles this season. Got to a point where they just wanted to release him. Um, And for Houston to claim him on waivers, I mean, that's okay. I think he's making under five hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot for mm-hmm. us. Not a lot for him, <laughs> but I don't know what his real impact will be. I honestly don't, and I think a lot of people are looking at what he was able to do in the past, but the past mm-hmm. is four seasons ago. Right now, if I ask myself, who would I rather take over, Barnett or my Jay Sanders? I don't know, Barnett mm-hmm. or Kerry Hyder who I think he registered a, a tackle for last Sunday. I don't know. I don't know. Even, 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 you know, Barnett or Hughes, I may give the edge to Hughes simply because he's older. I mean, uh, to, to Barnett because he's older, but I don't know. And so if I'm having these questions of I don't know this, okay, then what's going to be your real impact here? Can D'Amico get whatever he has left out of him and, and get some productiveness on the field, some impact on the field. And I go so far to say, well, he lost out on being able to do that on the Philly D line that features Jalen Carter, that features Jordan Davis, that features uh, Fletcher Cox. I just mentioned three D tackles that are all good. That I forget who's on the opposite side. But, the, you know, if he wasn't able to get it done in Philly, where your job was a little bit easier, I kind of question what his impact would be for Houston. There's two things that I'm looking at. One, um, after they came back from the bye week in the game against the Carolina Panthers, the Bucks, Cincinnati, and Arizona, the Houston Texans defensive line did register 15 sacks. So they, they were trending in the right direction. However, John, I must admit, 
I was a little confused by the Texans claiming Derek off of waivers only because of my Jay Sanders. And now I'm starting to wonder what is going on with my Jay because he was a healthy scratch Sunday for the game. So it's like you was a healthy scratch. You go out 24 hours later and you add another player at your position. What is going on with my Jay Sanders? And this is a guy to where I would say, given the fact that they did that they barely did that they barely got a pressure against the Jazz, they didn't get a sack. I look at Maje and say, man, maybe if he was healthy, he could have helped things. However, Maje has only played, I believe, in one or two games since coming here to the Houston Texans. And outside of maybe one or two plays, he have not made an impact as of yet. And this is a guy who I came on this show. I remember looking at his draft his draft status for last year's draft this is a guy i saw the potential and talent during his rookie season with arizona i thought that he would definitely give this defensive line unit enough boost to improve it in the area where coach demico ryan's definitely want to see them improve but yet here we are a couple weeks maybe a month after his arrival here in the city of houston he's already a healthy scratch and that's a red flag as the weather gets colder, the NFL offer stays hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Did y'all hear what I said? $150 right in your pocket if your team wins on any $5 bet. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. Now, the app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and much more. So visit FanDuel.com or download the app on your phone slash locked on NFL and make sure that you walk into the playoff push time of the year mm. of the NFL season with some fun, with some joy, and potentially $150 in your pocket in bonus bets. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts on of the Locked On channel, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel welcome back in ladies and gentlemen to to this tuesday installment of locked on texans and john i must say a couple days after thanksgiving i'm a little bit disappointed man you didn't you didn't do your signature this year and i know it's probably because you're busy with the new baby i must say but you haven't you haven't broke it down man you know what i'm talking about what i what haven't i done in my mind oh man <laughs> Ooh. well I, I i tell you what i tell you what right now i think i'm just for the sake of the other franchise right now uh i think i'm just waiting until i can positively say mm -hmm. this team is going to gift each and every fan a playoff mm. appearance Mm. I'm waiting for them to kind of gift everybody, you know, nice little battle red bow. And you can open it up on Christmas morning. Mm. And you can say to yourself, wow, my team is going to the playoffs. <laughs> and then at that moment, in my mind, we'll, uh, we'll have that discussion and then have fun at that point. Yeah, but the one thing that's been on D'Amico Ryan's mind over these last 24 hours was the penalty calls. Man. Because as you guys know, every Monday we have an opportunity to talk to Coach D'Amico Ryan's, and D'Amico did confirm that there were, I want to say, a couple of penalty calls that was called against the Houston Texans and Sunday's loss against Jacksonville that he did report to the league. Of course, it's not going to change the outcome. However, this is something that can possibly help this team moving forward. And rightfully so, because John, on paper, Seven total penalties, but out of those seven, four or five of them was very costly and very timely. And out of those four and five, I believe two or three set Jacksonville up on first and goal. 
And I understand Jacksonville might have had some issues with, 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 with the officiating as well. But once again, look, Texans had their opportunities to win this game. There was in it until the final second. We could go back and forth about whether or not they should have let Matt Amendola kick a field goal. Speaking of Matt Amendola, due to the um, signing of Derek, they did waive Matt. However, they're going to bring him back, sign him as a practice squad player to elevate him up. So he's definitely still going to be part of the Houston Texans for at least the next two weeks while Ka- Ka- Kaimi Fairbear um, continues to recover from his injury, his quad injury. But the officiating really did hurt this franchise on Sunday. It did. Yes, it did. And Coach Ryans has every right to feel away. <laughs> I did the uh, Bleacher Report stream uh, earlier today on this Monday. Mm-hmm. Third and 15, Houston 4. Uh, tank deal illegal shift that knocked out that a two yard Lord play. I mercy. think that was probably the worst call of the game. Mm, of the uh, year. The, Forget the game. Well, <laughs> D, D. Houston Carson pass interference. That was on third and goal. Mm. Um, the no catch Tank Dale, third and nine. Mm. Third quarter rolls around. Tavier Thomas pass interference, third and three. Tavier Thomas pass interference, third and goal. Uh, Steven Nelson defensive holding, third and seven. All of those calls was on third downs. So it hurt Houston. Now, Tavier Thomas, he was a culprit. <laughs> but that ghost call on Steven Nelson and that tick tacky call on, on Carson, I thought that was just kind of bogus. Mm. But the biggest play of the game, I think the biggest call of the game, I think was the erasing the 62 yard, uh, the 62 yard catch by Tank Dell. Yeah. And Houston on that third and goal, allowing Trevor Lawrence to kind of punch it in. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, shoot, that's a four point swing right there. Now you're looking at 21 20. Hmm. And Houston had an opportunity to win that game. So I stand with Ryan's coach mm. cap. Thank you guys for checking out today's episode. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. Follow the locked on page at locked on Texans as well. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.